Yes, it's me again, Emily Grassley of The Brain Scoop. Today, I wanna to tell you about a couple near misses for our planet that you should really know about. First, you hardcore SciShow news junkies will remember last March when we told you about 2012 DA14, an asteroid that was discovered last year to be heading toward Earth. Note that I said toward Earth, not for Earth. Because despite the media-wide pants wedding that took place last spring, DA14 is not going to collide with our lovely planet. But it will come closer than any asteroid has in recorded history, and you might even have a chance to glimpse it yourself. DA14 is only about 45 meters across, and NASA's Near Earth Object Program, which tracks objects like this, calculates that it will only come within 27,700 kilometers of Earth, about 8,000 kilometers closer than the estimates we first reported to you last year. So close that the asteroid will actually come within the orbit of some man-made satellites. And even though it poses no threat to us or any of our orbiting friends, like the Moon or the International Space Station, it will be good for a game of astronomical hide-and-seek. DA-14 is so small you probably won't be able to see it with the unaided eye, but it will be visible with a small telescope or even strong binoculars. The best viewing will be from Southeast Asia and Australia at around 3.30 in the morning of February 16th, local time, although observers might get a glimpse as far west as Eastern Europe. But sorry, America, DA-14 will make its closest approach at 2.30 in the afternoon Eastern time on February 15th, so by the time you get a view of the night sky, it'll have passed us by. If you miss it, you'll have to wait until 2020 when DA-14 is scheduled to return, and again, not hit us. Speaking of near misses, I don't know if you know Noticed, but our solar system recently underwent some rearranging, and it turns out that Earth barely kept its place in the order of things. See, astronomers recently revised their model for what they call the circumstellar habitable zone. Is it a zone that's inhabited? No, it's just the first place in a star system that astronomers check when they start looking for extraterrestrial life. The zone is defined as being just the right distance from a star, not too hot, not too cold, for liquid water to exist. Because here on Earth, life really likes water, so that's our best guess as to where it might like to hang out elsewhere. Last week, a group of geoscientists, astronomers, and astrobiologists from Penn State University and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center said that they'd revised the formula that astronomers use to find the habitable zone for each star. Their revision reflects what we've learned about how things like water and carbon dioxide absorb radiation to make planets hotter. When they factored in these new findings, they found that planets closer to their stars are probably hotter than we'd assumed, some of them too hot for liquid water. And some planets we'd thought would be too far and too cold might actually be warm enough to have water. So the whole zone basically took a step away from the heat source. Now, we don't know for sure that life needs water. As Penn State geoscientist Ravi Koparapu, who initiated the revision, pointed out, there could be silicon-based life forms, like on Star Trek. And why not? I mean, even on Earth we have extremophiles, organisms that exist in crazy conditions, like in terrific heat or pressure and even without liquid water. But water-based life forms are still our best bet because we recognize them and their signs. We don't know what kind of signs, say, silicon-based life forms would leave. So, where do we look for them? The new model says the best place for water is between 0.99 and 1.7 astronomical units from a star. 1 AU is the distance between Earth and the Sun, and it's the standard astronomers use to measure planetary orbits. This new definition doesn't change what planets in our own solar system are in the zone. It's still just Earth and Mars. But since the solar system's habitable zone starts at 0.99 AUs, that means that Earth barely makes the cut. We're on the hottest edge of the habitable zone. So shouldn't we be sweltering here? Well, yes, but we have clouds that reflect radiation, so we're not as hot as really far away alien astronomers might think we'd be. And that might be the case for many planets. Lots of things could affect their temperature. Mass, cloud cover, orbit shapes, axis, what kind of star they're orbiting. As we get better at detecting new planets, nearly 800 and counting, we're learning more about how to study these features so we can narrow our search for the most habitable ones. Thanks for joining me for SciShow News. If you have tips, ideas, or maybe some nice recipes you'd like to share, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter and always in the comments below.